would come and that we would be allowed to participate in it through the church evangelism efforts and through our loving kindness to each other in front of a watching world. We ask for your mercy to help us as we help the weak and sick in our midst. Let them sing your praises even while patiently suffering, knowing that they rest in the hands of their loving Father. We pray that you'd have a special mercy on those families and members and friends who do not know the love of Christ. We ask that you'd give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts of repentance and faith. And now we ask that you prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from you through the preached word. We ask that you'd be with Patrick and guide him by your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 77. This is our scripture reading and sermon passage for this evening. Psalm 77. Psalm 77, this is God's word. For the choir director, according to Jeduthun, a psalm of Asaph. My voice rises to God and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. In the night, my hand was stretched out without weariness. My soul refused to be comforted. When I remember God, then I am disturbed. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. You have held my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of long ago. I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart and my spirit ponders. Will the Lord reject forever? And will he never be favorable again? Has his loving kindness ceased forever? Has his promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? Then I said, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among your peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you. They were in anguish. The deeps also trembled. The clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth a sound, your arrows flashed here and there. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind, the lightnings lit up the world, the earth shook and trembled. Your way was in the sea, and your paths in the mighty waters, and your footprints may not be known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray, please. Father, thank you for this great psalm, this song of Israel, a song that we sing. May it minister to our souls and teach us the way out of excessive grief and sadness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do upright, godly Christian people experience overwhelming sadness? Yes, they do. Are such prayers as the opening 10 verses of Psalm 77 often on the lips of God's people? Yes, they are. The psalm doesn't tell us specifically what the cause of this melancholy state of mind was, but this being a psalm breathed forth by the Holy Spirit for God's people to sing and worship, we can rest assured that such thoughts and prayers have always been a part of the experience of true believers, even the godliest of them. God's people often feel as though they've fallen into a dark pit of mud they can't get out of. But even in the pit, we still know by instinct because of the Spirit of God within us to call out to him. In fact, that's why in his sovereign providence, we're in the pit in the first place. So we would call upon our Lord to help us, to save us. Even though the psalm writer refuses to be comforted, he says, is growing faint. He says he's not able to sleep. 
and he's in a state of severe doubting and testing, he still talks to God. He still cries out to God. There's not a person here who hasn't experienced this kind of thing. If you've lived even just a little while in the world, so much vexes and perplexes and hurts us. There's so much that seems to go against us. There's so much disappointment, so many betrayals, so many battles with sin that we lose and have to reap the sad consequences of. And those sad providences, those sad things that come at us from all angles. Things we can't control hurt us, and by our sin we often hurt ourselves and feel unworthy to wear the name Christian. In a world that groans under the curse of sin, we groan along with it ourselves. We long to be free of our troubles, don't we? We long to have a greater assurance that the goodness of God has not come to an end for us. We feel the burning dryness of soul that makes our sleep depart. We come to church, we look at everyone around us, and we think, it just seems so easy for everyone here but me. I have news for you. Everyone else is thinking the same thing about you. God is the giver of our blessings and our trials. We accept good and adversity from his loving hands. In sorrow and pain, we hear God calling to us to find our rest in his love, to find our rest in his word and promises, to find our rest and our peace in the marred face of our crucified and risen Lord. But there are times that our grief does go too far. It can go too far. But what we have in Psalm 77 here is grief and sadness that seems to have become the primary occupation of the psalm writer's life. So the first ten verses of this psalm, I think, are a warning. They're more of a warning than a pattern for us. They express the piercing reality of overwhelming sadness. A sadness that is so deep that it refuses to be comforted. And the last ten verses are the cure. The first 10 verses are a warning, the last 10 are a cure, if we would rise above that kind of despair. Our world is sad. When I was in seminary, one of the most profound lectures I ever heard was in a class I really didn't even want to take. I did not want to take pastoral care and counseling. I didn't want to take that class. I just wanted to study Greek and Hebrew and do theology and church history and apologetics and got to learn how to deal with all these problems, blah, blah, blah. One of these lecturers was a professional counselor, and he made statements in that lecture that were life-altering. He said one of the toughest parts about being a Christian and about being a Christian in a fallen world is learning how to live in a condition that God never intended us to live in. You have to live in a world where you know you're going to die and the people that you love are going to die and where you have to deal with, with sickness and disease and sin and lying. We were not designed to handle this stuff, and so it makes sense that we're going to have all sorts of problems doing that. The world is sad that you live in. It's got all kinds of regret and heartache. and We can only wonder at how sad Adam and Eve were during their very long lives on earth after the fall. God gave them some 900 years to think about what happened. How many times must they have replayed the scene at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I don't believe any couple ever experienced that much sadness or as much happiness and then lost it. How often they must have longed to have their innocence back, their righteousness back, to be at perfect ease in the presence of God instead of being fearful of his judgment. Adam and Eve knew sadness. They knew terrible sadness. What a day it must have been when they discovered their firstborn child, Cain, had killed Abel. Everyone here, like Adam and Eve, has had sadness in their lives. Some of our sadness is because of our own foolishness, our own sin. And some of it's because of things that are entirely out of our control. But whatever the cause may be, it's very important for believers to know that sadness, as awful as it can be at times, it does not need to consume us. We alone, unique from all the people on the earth who don't know God, we who do know him, we have the constant cure for that. The fresh spring of relief the greatest salve for our sores in remembering the gospel, remembering the mighty works of God. And you'll see that here in this wonderful psalm. But there's two key sections to it. They're very obvious. The first ten verses is kind of, here's what not to do when you're sad. And the second ten verses, maybe we should just preach on the second half of the psalm. No, let's look at it. Verse, look at verse 1. 
My voice rises to God, and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God, and he will hear me. Okay, stop there. Although this prayer will go on to express inconsolable sadness, there is one grand confidence of the individual praying. God can still hear me. God can still hear me. Remember Romans 8, 15 and 16. If you're a believer, you have the spirit of adoption. The, the instinct, no matter how bad things ever get, is still to cry out to God. God, help me. God, help me. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We have the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, help me. If you are a Christian, you will notice that even in your darkest moments, you'll still talk to God. Prayer is one of the great marks that someone is a true Christian. The newborn baby, as soon as it enters the world, cries out with its voice. It's the same with the newborn child of God. When the Holy Spirit of God takes up his eternal home in the bosom of a newly born again repentant believer, they will begin to cry out with God. They'll, they'll begin to start that conversation with God that will last the rest of their natural lives. When the lights go out and the overwhelming sadness comes, they still pray. We still talk to God. J.C. Ryle said this, quote, But this I do say, that not praying is a clear proof that a person is not yet a true Christian, that they cannot really feel their sins, they cannot really love God yet, they can't feel themselves a debtor to Christ, they can't long after holiness yet, they cannot desire heaven, they have yet to be born again, they have yet to be made a new creature. They may boast confidently of election, of grace, of faith, of hope, and knowledge, and deceive ignorant people, but you may rest assured it's all vain talk if they never pray. And I say furthermore that of all the evidences of the real work of the Spirit, a habit of hearty, private prayer is one of the most satisfactory that can be named. A person may preach from false motives. A person may write books and make fine speeches and seem diligent in good works and yet be a Judas Iscariot. But a person seldom goes into their closet and pours out their soul before God in secret unless they be in earnest. The Lord himself has set his stamp on prayer as the best proof of conversion. When he sent Ananias to Saul in Damascus, he gave him no other evidence of his change of heart than this. He told Ananias, behold, Saul is praying. End quote. Christians talk to their Father in heaven. Even in their lowest moments, like in Psalm 77, Asaph is still talking to God. Sometimes what we express to him betrays the fact that we've forgotten our father's true nature and character as good. Sometimes what we feel and pray shows that we ourselves have forgotten the story of our own salvation. That we've forgotten his steadfast love. The agony of his son in our behalf and the glorious promise of a happy eternal life. Look at verse 2. See verse 2? In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. In the night, my hand was stretched out without weariness. <clears throat> my soul refused to be comforted. Is it not a strange thing that <clears throat> temporary problems and troubles can cause true believers to refuse to be comforted? We've all experienced this. Even small children do this. A child skins their knee or they get their feelings hurt by something that that we did or said and we, we go to hold them and they pull away from us and they push us away. God has been kind and gave that child loving parents who are eager to be sympathetic, eager to show them kindness, either eager to clean off the wound and put a band-aid and ointment on it to make it hurt less, but the child will still refuse the one thing that they really need from someone who is more than ready to give it. We do the same thing with God. Sadness is a given. Tears are a given. Why do we sometimes refuse to be comforted? See that last part of verse 2? You see that last phrase? My soul refused to be comforted. God has taken us from the dry and weary desert where there is no water and has placed our feet right in front of a crystal clear, refreshing fountain of living water and has commanded us who are weary and thirsty and sad to drink fully as much as we want. And we refuse to drink. Instead, we stand and stare at the water, the very thing God gave to assuage our thirst, and we do nothing. God holds out his son, his promises, his all-sufficient word, which he has given us all that we need for life and godliness, and 
We refuse to be comforted. Ephesians is water. So is Romans. So is Isaiah. So is Deuteronomy. So is Micah. So is John's Gospel. So is Matthew. And all the rest of them. It's one thing to be sad over a certain condition in your life, over a difficult loss of a loved one that you've endured, over a sin that just won't seem to go away fully, or over something terrible that happened to you, but it's quite another to make grieving over that thing the constant preoccupation of your day in and day out life. Why is Psalm 72 verse, 77 verse 2 in our Bibles? Because the Holy Spirit of God is kind to us. He knows. Even a mature believer, a seasoned Saint can so act like a three-year-old child when it comes to this. Who turns away from the loving arms of father or mother that wants to comfort them in their pain. Who turns away from the word of God. Who turns away from what they know is true because we want to wallow in our pain. God knows that we do that as teenagers, as young adults, even as elderly saints at times. Notice in verse 2 here, this overwhelming sadness carried on into the night without weariness. You ever had a sleepless night? So troubled you couldn't sleep for a while, for a day, for a week, for a month, for a decade? Sleeplessness over grief, it happens to the best of Christian people. And sometimes the sadness is so great, even our remembrance of God himself disturbs us. Thinking about him upsets us. Look at verse 3, you see it? When I remember God, then I'm disturbed. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. Selah. In other words, pause and meditate on that one for a while. Remembering God upsets you, disturbs you. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. God himself can become troubling to us instead of a comfort. Job, in the depth of his pain, said this in Job 23, 15. Listen to this. He says, therefore, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I am afraid of him. Job is one of the godliest men who ever lived, so loved by God, and yet he's thinking, I'm afraid of him. Look at what he did to me. There was a great missionary to Burma long ago in the 19th century, Adoniram Judson, a towering giant of the, of the faith, experienced such unbelievable hardship on the mission field that I would venture to say that these first three verses of Psalm 77 characterized his heart for long periods of time in his life. This man was put in prison when he was in Burma, trying to bring the gospel to that pagan land. He was tortured. He was hung up three inches off the ground by his hands and feet all night long, night after night after night. He lost two wives who died on the mission field. He buried seven of his 13 children on the mission field. One biographer said this about this guy. Quote, while he was suffering in prison, Adoniram had said to a fellow prisoner, it is possible my life will be spared. If so, with what ardor shall I pursue my work? If not, his will be done. The door will be opened for others who would do the work better. But now that his wife and daughter were gone, darkness began to settle over his soul. Folks, you have to understand something. There are thousands of Christian churches in Burma today, in Myanmar today, because of this guy. Because he translated the entire Bible into Burmese, a language it had never been in before. But listen to what he went through. Listen to this. In July, three months after the death of his little girl, he got word that his father had died eight months earlier. The psychological effects of these losses were devastating. Self-doubt overtook his mind, and he wondered if he had become a missionary for ambition and fame and not humility and self-denying love. He dropped his Old Testament translation work, the love of his life and retreated more and more from people and from anything that might conceivably support pride or promote his pleasure. He refused to eat outside the mission. He destroyed every encouraging letter he had ever received from anyone. He formally renounced the honorary doctor of divinity that Brown University had given him in 1823 by writing a letter to the American Baptist magazine. He gave all his private wealth to the Baptist board. He asked that his salary be reduced by one quarter and promised to give more to missions himself. In October of 1828, he built a hut in the jungle some distance from the Mount or Mulamine Mission House and moved in on October 24th, 1828, the second anniversary of his wife's death, to live in total isolation. 
He wrote in one letter home to his wife's relatives, quote, My tears flow at the same time over the forsaken grave of my dear love and over the loathsome sepulcher of my own heart. He had a grave dug beside the hut and sat beside it, contemplating the stages of the body's decomposition. He ordered all his letters in England to be destroyed. He retreated for 40 days alone further into the tiger-infested jungle and wrote in one letter that he felt utter spiritual desolation. Quote, he wrote this, God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him, but I find him not. End quote. Is he still a Christian? Does God still love him? God was far from finished with this guy. He remarried he had several more children before his second wife died. Later, when he was 57 years old, he married a much younger woman. She was only 29. There was a big scandal about it. He didn't give a rip. That precious wife of his wrote these words on the day of their first anniversary. Quote, it has been far the happiest year of my life. And what is in my eyes still more, more important, my husband says it has been among the happiest of his. I never met any man who could talk so well, day after day, on every subject, religious, literary, scientific, political, and nice baby talk, too. And this was written about the man who, in the depths of his God-ordained, God-designed darkest days, said, God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him, but I find him not. I want to encourage you all to remember, God may very well plan to bring you into some better days if you're in the midst of Psalm 77, verses 1 through 10. Have hope that he can do that. But nonetheless, Judson held on to Jesus, or rather, I should say, Jesus held on to him. And through these unspeakable trials and sufferings, was molded into an even greater spiritual giant of a man. When the author of Psalm 77 remembered God, the one who alone should have been his comfort in his distress, the mere thought of God in his presence troubled him even more. Just like the crying child that jerks their arm away from the loving parent who wants nothing more than to comfort them with their reassuring presence and their touch. The child jerks away. We do the same thing at times. You can't understand what I'm going through. You can't possibly still love me. Have you ever asked God that question in prayer? Why have you decided that you hate me? Why have you decided to set me up and use me for target practice, for your arrows? Look at verse 4. You have held my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Whatever this guy is going through, whatever Asaph is going through, he can't even find the words to express it in detail. And thus, all they can express in words is their inability to speak their trouble in words. Sometimes our thoughts are so exercised, so disordered, that all we can say is that our pain is so great, we can't even talk about it. There doesn't seem to be relief anywhere, no matter what we do or where we look or what passages we read. Look at verse 3 again. When I remember God, I am disturbed. Now look at verse 5. <clears throat> I've considered the days of old, <clears throat> the years of long ago. Sometimes in the midst of terrible heartache and sadness, we'll go back in our minds to the good old days. And go back to happier days. Since we've tricked ourselves into thinking there's no relief anywhere in the days that I'm in now. Not even in Jesus. Well, think about a time when life was better. The years of long ago. Do you do that? I do that. I still do that. Do you remember the days of innocence? The days without trouble? The days when there were no worries? It's so easy to make an idol out of the past. And then to find consolation in that idol instead of in God. God always knows better. Ecclesiastes 7.10 says, Do not say, Why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. When you wish you could go back and find a day of peace there, you're not being wise, it says. We're not called to live in the past, nor are we called to live with our hearts in the future in this life. We're called to live today, to live upon God today in all of our distresses, in the present, because that's where we are. The psalm writer goes on, verse 6. I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart and my spirit ponders. You know, music can have a, a huge effect upon us. It can have a healing effect upon us, but it can also be an idol. We remember songs that made us happy in the past and 
play them in our hearts, play them on devices. We listen and listen, hoping to find relief from overwhelming sadness. We all have our songs that we like to listen to that, that meant something to us at some point in our lives, and that certainly can have its place, but it's not a replacement for God. While the memories of beautiful and meaningful music are blessings from God, they're not our rock, they're not our stronghold in the times of trouble. I've seen in the comment sections on, on YouTube, this song got me through this time, this song got me through this trial, this song did this in my life. Just remember, music's a gift from God, but it can easily be an idol. Grief is never our job, nor is it our constant preoccupation. If the loss of any earthly good brings us to the state of mind and heart that's narrated in Psalm 77, 1 through 10, then we need to consider, was the thing that we lost perhaps an idol that competed with God for our affection? Grief will have its hour, but grief's not our life's work. Yes, grieve in a way that glorifies God. I remember James Montgomery Boyce ma making that, teaching me that wonderful biblical truth many years ago. The Christian faith does not give us a way around problems or around pain or around sadness. It's a way through all of those things in a way that glorifies God. When the unbeliever loses his earthly treasure, he's lost it all. He's lost everything he lives for. But the child of God has a treasure that moths can't eat, that death cannot separate us from which thieves cannot break in and steal, which will never fade away as it's reserved in heaven for us. God is our portion. He cannot die, nor can his grace and love diminish or be lost. Look at verse 7 through 9. Will the Lord reject forever, and will he never be favorable again? Has his loving kindness ceased forever? Has his promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious, or has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? Selah. Every child of God knows the answer to every one of those questions. Those are rhetorical questions. And yet, they're really being asked. God, have you forgotten everything you promised? Will you ever show me favor again? Those whom God foreloved and predestined, called, justified, and glorified can never be rejected. Why are you asking God, have you rejected me? When God bestowed his favor in Christ upon anyone, he never forgets them. God's loving kindness, his steadfastness will never cease. God's promise is as sure as his own continued existence. You know, when I do pre-marriage counseling or, or marriage counseling, one of the things I always tell those young people that are getting ready to get married or tell married couples that are struggling, don't use words like always or never. You always, da-da-da. You never, da-da-da. Why? Because you're lying. Those things are always never true. There, I just use both of them. We can't talk about other people with words like always, never, you always, you never, because they're not accurate of us. But always and never are great words with God. They're perfect words with him. When he says, I will never leave you, he means never. Verse 10, look at verse 10. Then I said... It's my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. Now, verse 10 is kind of a transitional verse. Here, the psalmist, the commentators point out, seems to be confessing that this overwhelming despair, this sadness, it's kind of my fault. You see the opening phrases? Then I said, it's my grief. It's my fault that I'm this low, not God's. Despondency, total despondency, it's a sin that easily besets us. Distrusting God under pain and affliction, it's a bad habit, even for the godliest of Christian people. And thus, we ought to be ashamed of that kind of sin and repent of it. But the cure for it is right in the second half of the psalm. Look at verses 11 and following. Here's the cure. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Remember Genesis 1? The greatest week in the history of the universe, God spoke the most glorious and untainted paradise into being out of nothing. His creation of man out of the dust of the ground, his breathing into us the breath of life, and we became living beings capable of communion with God. God flooded the entire world and saved aid in the ark to assure that the Messiah would still come into the world. God spoke to Abram and made an old man and a barren old woman conceive a child, Isaac. 
God allowed Israel's son Joseph to be sold into slavery and chained up in prison, but it was all to make Joseph a great man, to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and to save their lives and the lives of the men that betrayed him. God gave the promised land to the people of Israel. God brings back the exiles from, the, and they rebuild the temple and the wall, and God has done all these great things. And then you have Jesus who comes and rids the entire world of where he was of disease and heals people and brings hope to the hopeless and shatters all the walls that were separating people. What's the cure to overwhelming sadness? Remember the works of God and his wonders of old. And I want to encourage you, remember your story. Remember your story. When you think of your life, can you not reflect on all the ways which the goodness of God has protected you? Can you see all the good that he's done you in your life? How quickly we forget it all. I'm so guilty of that. We've been through things in the last few years that have been heart shattering. It's like you forget all the good God has done you. You forget all the blessings he's poured out day after day after day. Don't forget those things just because you face some days of sadness. Don't cry out to God, have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten to be gracious? Have you forgotten this? Will you ever be nice to me again? If God sent someone into your life or gave you Christian parents who told you about Jesus and told you you needed to repent and prayed for you, you're a truly blessed person. Never allow the suffering you endure to cause you to forget how gracious it was for God to show you his son, to show you Christ. Think about the people that have loved you, the people that have prayed for you, that pointed you to the Savior. No earthly suffering can outweigh the goodness of God and thinking of your eternal happiness and then securing it by sending people that loved you into your life to tell you those things. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> here, still pulling himself out of the pit here. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God, he says. Don't allow the thought of God to disturb you. Know that the one true and living God is holy. He's never unfair or unjust to us. His ways are right, and all that we experience is planned. It's all put forward for our good in this life and the next. And in light of that, let everyone exclaim in their prayers, what God is great like our God? Even in the midst of verses 1 through 10, this is how you get out of it. You remember the greatness of God. Remember all that he's done for you. The fact that you're still talking to him and praying to him is proof that he loves you, that your faith is hanging on. Verse 14. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. Our glorious God, the one and only true God, has been making a name for himself among the peoples of the world from the beginning. Through us and our salvation and his carrying us through every earthly trial, he makes a name for his glorious grace. His fame and his majesty have reached our ears and we know the ancient of days ourselves. We get to know this God ourselves. We have come to see and know the creator and maker of all of these wonders without number around us. If you had a chance to enter into the totality zone, remember that? Was that 2017 that total eclipse happened? I took the little Google dude and just dropped him in the middle of the totality zone and we just drove down there and it was a church parking lot. I had no idea where we were actually going. But when the, the sun finally disappeared completely, it was a soul-stirring experience because it suddenly got cold. <laughs> the chill of the air and all the birds jumped out of the trees and started chirping and going crazy. And you could see the stars. And then you could see the corona around the moon on the sun there. And then the, the light on the ground was wavy like that. It was absolutely amazing. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You know, I watch a lot of Answers in Genesis stuff. I watch a lot of creation stuff. And drone footage of a blue whale coming up for a breath of air showed up on my little YouTube feed. It's a 30 second video. And it was so amazing to see. It said, listen to the largest lungs in the universe. It looked like a volcano erupting. Blue whales, I did, did a little Google search. Those things when they're full grown weigh between 290 and 330,000 pounds. That's 165 tons. They're as long as three school buses and weigh more than 15. They're bigger than any dinosaur that ever lived or walked on this planet. And they're there in the ocean and they come up for a breath and it's like a volcano erupting and those two big spouts and they draw in all this air and then the tail comes up out of the water and then goes back down from tip to tip. It's 25 feet long. That's longer than four of me laying here. 
God is the God of wonders. He's the God of wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. There are wonders without number all around you every day. You know, one really cool thing about moving to a new part of the world, there's all kinds of critters down here I've never seen before. In this part of the country, there are little white pieces of what look like lint floating through the air. And I caught one in my hand. I thought it's a piece of dust or a piece of something just as white as snow. It looked like a snowflake. And then it started crawling on my hand. I'm like, it's a bug. Immediately pulled out my phone. What looks like a piece of fuzz with legs? And there's these little bugs that live down here in this part of the world. I thought, isn't that amazing? It's actually alive. And you see these little things floating through the air? And they eat every day. They don't worry about anything. God is the God without wonders. Look around you. There's every reason to trust him. Jesus told us, look at birds, look at bugs, look at, look at the lilies of the field. Look at verse 15. Here, how do we forget this one? You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. There it is again, that word Selah. Probably means, now pause and meditate on this. Pause and chew on that. Every time you see that, it's, okay, God wants you to really chew on what he just said. You've redeemed your people. This is the third and final Selah there in the passage, which is, as I said, a musical interlude. It's kind of like run through the, the verse again, but no words this time, so you can reflect on what you just sang. Allow it to sink in. My overwhelming sadness consumes me because my mind and my heart are not filled with enough of the Lord, are not filled with Christ the way that they should be. You remember when Paul was trying to encourage that, that young congregation there at the church at Ephesus? Listen to how he, he tells them to keep Christ in their hearts. He says this in Ephesians 3.13. Therefore I ask that you don't lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, it says in the Proverbs, if we faint in the day of adversity, our strength is small. You know, when I played high school sports, the coaches always said the same thing. Good, good football players, good basketball players are made in the off season. They're made in the off-season. They're made based on how much you train and how hard you work. It's the same with the Christian life. If we're good in the spiritual disciplines, if we fill our hearts with the word of God, if we are close communion and fellowship with Christ always, when the trial happens, when the bottom falls out, we'll be ready because Christ is in our hearts. The gracious love that God has shown his people, that's the rock, dear ones. And we all know that. That's the rock. Everything else is sand. Your favorite songs are sand, unless they're from scripture. Everything else is sand. If we would truly understand just the smallest part of the vastness of divine love for us, the despondency of verses 1 through 10, it would not crush us and crush our blessed hope. So what's the answer to our despondency? Stop thinking about us and fix our minds on Christ. Get a journal, write down the passages of scripture that speak to your heart and memorize them. Wear that Bible down to the nub like Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord all night. If you walk away limping a little, that's probably a good thing. Do not forget that God is the God of wonders. He's the God of our salvation, the God who redeemed us, the God who in Christ loved his people, bore their curse, the God who has sworn by his integrity and holiness he will never forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5, great verse. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. One of the great Greek grammarians of our time, a man named Daniel Wallace, describes that clause as a clause of emphatic negation. There, there are actually five negations in the passage. I heard one preacher say, Hebrews 13, 13, 5 says, I will never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. Some translate it as, I will never, some, I will not at all forsake you. But the force was clear. Those who know Christ, God will not leave them. We may ask him if he has. We, we know the answer. He hasn't. Even when the most despondent, sad prayers are on our lips, God's promise still holds firm. 
Aren't you thankful it doesn't depend on how strongly you believe it? I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will not fail you. Even when you're troubled by thinking of God, even when the thoughts of the key passages that you love, maybe you've sinned so much, I don't deserve to have any comfort from these passages anymore, he still won't leave you or abandon you. His greatness and his glory are still the solution to the sin of absolute despondency. Total sadness, despair, they're sinful. We shouldn't, we shouldn't go there. We're not wanting to live anymore. We shouldn't go there. We'll be sad in this world, you bet. We're going to go through loss. You're going to have times that it's, it's very hard to rest and sleep and real heartache that just crushes your spirit and makes your stomach drop. Grief's a process. It, God's people have to go through it. But grief is not our unending or constant estate. We grieve, as 1 Thessalonians 4 says, not as those who have no expectation, no hope of glory. The psalm writer continues to stir his own memories of God. Look at verse 16. The water saw you, O God. What's he remembering here? The exodus. Going through the Red Sea, the people of God. The water saw you. They were in anguish. The deeps also trembled. Verse 17. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth a sound. Your arrows flashed here and there. Verse 18, the sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Verse 19 and 20, your way was in the sea and your paths in the mighty waters and your footprints may not be known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The cure for overwhelming sadness, which we all go through it, we all experience it, is to feed on the faithfulness and the power of God. To fill your mind with the words of scripture to revel in the absolute certainty of his promises, to contemplate his marvelous holiness, his majestic glory, to remember his works of creation, providence, his mighty acts of redemption, to look at the cross of our Lord and try to comprehend. Paul says, I'm praying for y'all there in Ephesus that you might be able to comprehend the width and length and depth and height of God's love for you. But I know you probably never will fully get it. I don't think even in heaven we'll fully get it. What's wrong with your soul in those moments when you can't sleep because of sadness or anxiety? What's missing when you can't even find the words to express your grief or find comfort in, the thing, in thinking about God himself? What's missing is the greatness of the name and glory of the triune God. They're perpetually relevant to every situation of our lives. And we, we so easily forget that. If we would keep ourselves from the miry pit of despondency, of sadness, we would do well to stand our knees before the Almighty to remember his wonders and his redemptive work, to train ourselves not to turn to quick fixes or easy comforts in the midst of hardship, which we're all tempted to do that. We think that maybe if I listen to this or, or do this or that, maybe that'll give me a little bit of relief, but to train ourselves to do what the psalm writers did. Remember the works of God. Remember his faithfulness to you. Remember how he saved you. Remember what Jesus suffered. Remember his redemptive works to seize every opportunity he gives us to speak of the cross and the gospel to ourselves, to speak of it to others, to remember our own story of how in his infinite goodness, mercy, and grace he saved us. Remember how God orchestrated the events of your life so you would not just hear the gospel but actually believe it? We who are the children of God must ever and always be training ourselves to remember this wondrous meditation of scripture. Remember 1 John 3, 1 and 2? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Yes, children that often, like our own children, will jerk away from God. I don't want your comfort. I can't think about you right now. Thinking about you troubles me. You're the one that's afflicting me. Behold what manner of love God has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. We wouldn't be praying to God. We wouldn't be wrestling with him if we weren't his children. Remember that God never ceases to be with his children. He never ceases to love them. He never ceases to hold on to them even when they pull away from him. And he never ceases to be faithful to them. And there, that's where we have the cure for overwhelming sadness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that you love us so much more than even the best of Christian parents could ever love their own children. That even when we pull away from you or we find the thoughts of you troubling, you still love us. We still are under the outstretched wings of our creator who protects us, who loves us, who has prayed that our faith would not fail so that we do cry out to you in the night watch when things are hard. Help us to remember these things, to notice these kinds of psalms, to see the 
the piercing reality of living in a fallen world where there's so much difficulty and there's hardship. But Lord, we pray you would help us not to allow the difficult seasons to cause us to forget all the good that you've done to us, to forget that you've redeemed your people, that Christ is alive, that our hope is in heaven. May our hearts be there with him, seated at your right hand. May we set our hearts on heavenly things so that we're not so overwhelmed by the earthly things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 355. Let's stand to sing 355. 355.